There were a lot of aspects about the film, as it is an experimental film and as it's an abstract film, it wasn't really narrative in the way that a typical narrative film is. And so it was difficult to not be able to list the shots and have specifically what we wanted, especially because we were only in Jeffet for one day and we didn't have access to it before then. I, again, had the picture in my mind of what Jeffet would look like, but I wasn't entirely sure. Though this was my first time filmmaking, this was, from what I understand, not a typical filmmaking experience in terms of how we kind of just had to hit the ground running and pull everything together with not a lot of time. So I think it went really well. I think I've been very lucky to work with the people that I've been working with. Luckily, Rashad really <laughs> helped me out. As an experienced filmmaker, he really knew how to make my vision a reality and also like help create the vision, I suppose. We got permission from the Royal Film Commission, which was relatively easy. We didn't realize that we had to get military permission, which we didn't realize up until we were there and setting things up. And then we realized that we had to go to the police station and kind of figure things out. It was also um, an abandoned prison and there was broken glass everywhere, broken glass and sand everywhere. So we had an amazing team that was like sweeping, <laughs> sweeping right before I went to any particular part of the prison. I think Jeffer is just just, it holds such a significance in Jordan and that I didn't fully realize until making this film and I'm still realizing the significance of Jeffet. I heard the word growing up, Jeffet, like it's kind of was always in my mind as, oh, the prison that Jiddo was in, but I didn't realize that it had the significance of being a prison specifically for political prisoners. So it's kind of, it's interesting to kind of be discovering this bit by bit. So Jeffet is an incredible place and I'm still in the process of discovering the history and the significance of it. I think arriving there was really surreal because again, I only had my imagination and we had one bird's eye view shot of Jeffet. So like, we didn't even really know when we were really there. <laughs> you know, like there were several walls and then we were like unsure when we had finally arrived. But it was definitely a overwhelming feeling of like giddiness and antsiness. And we had always hoped that we would be able to make this film happen, but none of us knew for sure. Um, so I think once we realized that we were actually there and I had, see I had seen the courtyard and um, we had someone who was kind of pointing things out, being like, this is the courtyard, this is the kitchen, this is the solitary confinement cells. At that point, I think I felt overwhelming emotion and I immediately called my father who also was never entirely sure that we were going to be able to make this work. Over the phone with both of us was just a very, it was very emotional. We both <laughs> started tearing up a little bit over the phone. I'm not a very spiritual person, but I think Something definitely shifted to be in this prison where my grandfather had been and to be in the space where these letters that I had been obsessively reading were written. I think because the letters were maintained as handwritten documents um, that have been photocopied, it was very different for me to see his handwriting and also kind of the stained paper that it was written on. It was a very different experience than having, if I had seen it, you know, typed up in a Word document. So I think that held a very different significance for me. It was really beautiful to read them, but I think the moment where I realized something had to be made from them was when I realized how many there are. Because not only are there letters from my grandfather to my grandmother and my grandmother to my grandfather, there's also letters from my uncle to my grandfather and my grandfather to my uncle. My father was really, really young at the time that my grandfather father was in prison so he wouldn't have been old enough to write but there are also references to my father in these letters so I really felt overwhelmed <laughs> but because of how many there were and how beautiful the language is I was really amazed and impressed and I felt like something had to be created with them I felt like I would be doing them a disservice to just let them sit in this house for the music, I'd say there are two different sections. So one, we definitely wanted to work with Sound Source Studio. We wanted to work with Isa and Masis to have music that was composed for the film. We did a lot of kind of copy paste things where we were just like slapping different kinds of music on there and none of it felt right. It either felt too cheesy or like, it just didn't fit the mood that we were trying to create. And I felt like I wanted music that would reflect the movement. 
I haven't made anything where I created the movement and then had music written for the movement, whereas usually it's the other way around. I think this was just like a really exciting opportunity to work with Nisa and Masis, who are so professional and really spent so much time and effort to make the music fit the film, and they were very responsive to our suggestions. You know, we kind of wanted um, Middle Eastern instruments, but to maintain kind of an experimental aura about it, which they did perfectly. And we wanted something that was a little bit minimalistic in some parts and haunting in some ways, but not something super, super dramatic. And so they really listened to all of the suggestions that we had and they, they saw it. They saw the vision and they created exactly what the film needed. And again, I think it would have been a disservice to the film, to the letters, to have just something slapped on. Even if we had gotten the rights for a song that was pretty good, I felt like it wouldn't have worked for us to just copy paste something on there. In terms of the clarinet playing at the end, my grandfather wrote this song, Alelu Yanana, and he wrote it for my grandmother while he was in prison. He was a oud player, so he played the oud and he composed this song for her. It was really just like a basic melody with some lyrics to it, and different things have been done with that melody and those words since then. There has been someone who made an orchestrated version and with different kinds of melodies and harmonies and singing, some more operatic, some more traditional. And while I have so much appreciation for all of the things people have done with that melody, I wanted something a little bit more grounded and a little bit more simple, and I wanted something that was coming from our family directly. And so my dad played the clarinet and he played that melody and we recorded it. And even though Masis definitely added things on top of it, it was his clarinet playing was untouched. And we felt like that was necessary because of just how much emotion was heard in the clarinet playing itself and in this melody. And I really wanted to leave it kind of untouched as this um, almost sacred artifact, almost, from that time, and to give it as much respect as we're giving the letters. So that was really important. Rashad was doing all of the editing, and I was in the background for a lot of that and being like, you know, I like it better this way, we should put this here, kind of small, small decision-making, stuff like that. I was a part of the process of putting it together, so I didn't really have a moment of like watching it all for the first time altogether. But I would say the first, I think maybe three days after we filmed it, Rashad was amazing and put together like a really, a really impressive version of it, which is very close to the version that we, that we have now. We watched it just in my living room with the team and my dad and some family members. It was very exciting to see what we had made and also just the professionalism that Rashad put towards the film and how seriously we were taking it all of a sudden because it was a fantasy at the beginning. That concept of it was a fantasy and then it just started merging with reality in a way that I was never prepared to happen and I don't think any of us were prepared to have that happen. Watching it that time in our living room was really significant. I think also because it was the first time my father had watched it and I was watching it with him. Similar to when I got to Jafet, we both got emotional <laughs> because we do that together. Um, so that was really special. And it felt complete, even though I knew, again, as a first time filmmaker, I don't know when a film is complete. But to me, watching it then, it felt whole. We wanted to show different parts of the prison and I wanted to kind of reflect the things that he had written in the letters about certain parts of the prison. So the courtyard, uh, the solitary confinement cell, these kind of hallways that have really interesting shadows um, because of the canopies above it. We had very little time. In total filming time, I think it was about three hours, maybe four. A lot of it was just running around trying to capture what we could, the most interesting parts of the prison and the parts of the prison that were reflected in the letters. And I think we kind of wanted to piece it together as a, obviously it's not a narrative, but as kind of a scrapbook of experiences. We kind of wanted to give it almost a dreamlike quality because being there felt like a memory that I wasn't entirely aware that I had. So I think we wanted to put it together as a way of reflecting that, as a way of reflecting these kind of fragmented memories that intergenerational trauma comes in, you know, where you're being in a place and it feels really surreal and bizarre and unsure whether 
you've been here before or whether it's just the amount of information that you've gotten about the place that makes it feel like you had been there. And so I kind of wanted to give it that kind of quality where it's not just copy paste and just like pasting things in an order and putting them together, but kind of a dreamlike quality and then show the um, different kinds of generational trauma that exist in these letters. And so that kind of played into the different scenes and the different characters that we had performing all were performed by me, but the kind of different perspectives that we wanted to take for these letters. I'm still discovering the significance of Jafar because the more that I speak to people in Amman and outside of Amman about Jafar, like sometimes their eyes will light up when I least expect it and they'll be like, oh, I know about Jafar. And you can tell because they're just like, you can see the, the heaviness in their eyes, in their understanding of what Jafar is. It holds such a significance for the grandchildren of people who had been imprisoned there. And I'm constantly having more and more people reach out to me and saying, oh, I saw, I saw the poster for your film. My grandfather was in Jafar. And then we do a little bit of research and then it turns out that their grandfather knew my grandfather. And because it was a relatively small prison, it wasn't very large. It's just really interesting. The more that I learn about Jafar, the more connections are being made. The more I'm realizing that it clearly does have a big significance for a lot of people. I think the amount of letters that existed between my grandfather and my grandmother and my later on my grandfather and my uncle at this time when I discovered how many there were and how beautifully they were written. I wouldn't be doing them justice if I was just letting them sit in the house. And different members of my family have done, done different things with these letters, where whether it's writing reflections or making different forms of art. But I felt like I wanted to kind of get to know my grandfather through these letters and through this exploration of Jafar. It was an important time for me to make this work and become familiar with these letters and become familiar with him and the prison that he was in for three years. I think there's a lot of stigma behind accepting the traumas that we have in the Middle East and discussing trauma and I think Especially because we live in such a turbulent region of the world, we need to not only accept, but move in and through the intergenerational trauma that we all experience as children of, of this region. All the way from the Ottoman Empire, we've had different um, conflicts that our grandparents and their parents have been a part of, and we fail to acknowledge how those memories and experiences live within us and how they influence our behaviors and how maybe we have scraps of those memories inside of us. We don't really have those conversations with each other. That's kind of missing. Alongside of that, how these memories exist within our bodies, how we move around Amman and different parts of the region differently because of these experiences we have. Not only talking about intergenerational trauma, but I wanted this to promote dialogue about how these traumas and our ancestors and their stories and their memories live within our bodies now. I think the youth of the Middle East is really bringing forward a lot of revolutionary ideas from the re revolution in Lebanon and all of the amazing creations that have been made in the Middle East over the past, I mean always, but over the past like 10, 20 years. There has been kind of a platform created by Arab artists to support this work and to allow conversations about memory and about trauma to happen. So I think, um, and dance has always been a w kind of on the sidelines of that. Dance has always been something that we kind of dabble in, but at least in terms of in Jordan, we haven't fully embraced the knowledge that our bodies have. And I think I just wanted to give it an additional little push forward if I could and kind of allow us to start making these connections with bodies and memory. I'm primarily a choreographer and I love improvisation. There's like, it holds a special place in my heart that I, that we just went there and I had a few concepts set up, but for the most part, the film was improvised. And that, again, that gives it a special kind of magic, but the choreographer in me is like, oh, I wish that we had had more time in Jafar. Like even if we had had just a few more hours where I could have been without the cameras, without anyone just left to kind of experiment. And even though it wasn't 
necessarily a space meant for dancing. There was glass all over the floor and like broken pieces of ceramics and stuff. Even though it wasn't a space that was necessarily conducive for dancing and performance making, especially barefoot, I wish I had had more time to create work in that space rather than just trying to take in everything that was around me and hit the ground running. Because I had a lot of time researching Jafar. I had a lot of time looking. Every picture of Jafar that exists on the internet, I have seen. <laughs> and I had carefully tried to draw maps of the prison based on this information and based on what we knew. It's not the same as being there. The emotions of being there were so overwhelming that make me feel what I created in the moment is worth seeing and is definitely important and has created something beautiful beautiful. Every time I watch the film, I wonder what could have been made. Definitely something longer than eight, nine minutes. It definitely could have been something that could have been half an hour long, especially now with different people reaching out whose relatives have been in Jafet. I wonder what it would have been like to bring them into the space as well. I and mean, all of these are possibilities for the future. This was just our first time just going in there, hit, again, hit the ground running and see what'll happen. I always wonder what I could have created if I had had more time. <laughs>